What I want to do is to finish the first lecture, which was about systems. Um, then, in what would have been the second lecture, I'll uh, uh, talk about wonderful theoretical aspects. But I want to have one more system to talk about. Um, uh, so I discussed this one as a, as a putative system whereby you can build um, a perfect uh, bilayer capacitor, um, namely if you can construct charged interfaces, um, and uh, the charged interfaces here have a fixed charge because there's a chemical difference between 2 plus here and 3 plus there. Um, and of course, that generates a potential. The next interface, which has to reverse this, has the opposite charge, so it's overall neutral. You have an electric field extending out of this plane, and of course, that electric field will, will attract carriers to it, any carriers which are thrown in there. But in particular, if you happen to be good enough at this, uh, that you have no extrinsic carriers, um, you can get to a situation where the potential drop from one plane to another uh, exceeds the band gap, and once the potential drop exceeds the band gap, you'll get carriers transferred from one layer to another. Now, as I pointed out here, uh, in this system that hasn't happened yet because we haven't managed to make systems where the carriers are intrinsic, but actually I was uh, pleased to see some posters out there um, with some suggestions that other materials, in fact more interesting materials, essentially cuprates, you may indeed be able to do this, so I'm eagerly waiting for those results. But I do want to point out um, something else, actually, where uh, nature does this for us, um, and uh, this is actually a group of, a class of ferroelectrics, closely related to materials that you now will know, not because they're ferroelectrics, but because they're topological insulators. So I have another story. This is not about topological insulators, uh, but something accidental might happen as a result of work on topological insulators. Um, start with structure of group 5 or group 6 elements, um, arsenic or selenium. Um, they are best thought of as these are p bonded materials. They're heavy <coughs> elements. Uh, the S levels are rather not important. So basically, the band structure of these consists of p bonds in the x direction, the y direction, and the z direction. <coughs> arsenic, if you Put it in that form would actually be nearly simple cubic, nearly a simple cubic, but the bands are exactly half filled. And so in the x direction, you have a Clouse distortion, which dimerizes, and in the y and in the z, and these things stack up to produce planes like this. Um, interestingly, selenium does basically, selenium and tellurium does basically the same thing. Um, the, uh, in this case, however, the bands are two-thirds still, so you get this period of superpowers distortion, and as you line them up, this ends up making now uh, chains. And these are chiral. Um, so uh, this is a wonderful material because actually it has a, uh, uh, it, it has a chiral structure. Um, there's been a bit of inf interest actually in chiral CDWs uh, recently, um, and in some sense this is the prototype. Now, what happens if you take a group 5 element like arsenic and replace half the atoms by group 4 and half by group 6? The average valence is the same, and you end up with something like germanium telluride or tin telluride. Um, so now, actually, if the atoms were in their cubic symmetry positions, this would simply be a rock salt structure. Very simple crystal structure, and that's what you see. I mean, you don't get, but again, you're not getting rock salt in these materials because it's uh, um, because it's ionically charged, uh, you're getting rock salt because of the p-bats. However, indeed, materials like germanium telluride at relatively high temperatures and tin telluride at low temperatures do deform from the rock salt structure with exactly the same um, uh, displacement as arsenic. Um, so indeed, it dimerizes, but as it dimerizes, however, the atoms are alternately different. And the effect of the dimerization is to introduce a dump bond. So these materials are, are in fact, ferroelectric at low temperatures. Um, and that ferroelectricity, then you can actually see, comes from the soft onto the foam. Now, in fact, there are other variants of these structures where you just where you take something with more or less the same average valence, 
uh, ones you may know are things like this is bi 2 t 3 And that can be viewed in exactly the same structure as this. However, this is not a ferroelectric. It actually has an interesting quadrant model, as I'll point out. It's a five-layer material that goes tellurium, bismuth, tellurium, bismuth, tellurium, and then there's another one in the five-layer step. Um, all of these materials, however, are either ferroelectric, namely that they actually have a broken symmetry version, or they're nearly so. And the way you can see that they're nearly so is that when you have, if it was in the frozen air crystal structure, and there was a small displacement here, which is just an optic phonon, you can measure the dipole moment induced by the, this optic phonon in these materials. What I point out is that it's enormous. If the ions were charged plus one, plus two, plus three, the number in here, the second uh, Born effective charge, transverse effective charge, would be the charge on the iron, and actually the numbers are often uh, much bigger than that. Point out, even in tellurium, by the way, interestingly, a material which is not uh, it's just tellurium, it has, because it has a chiral crystal structure, the optic phonons in that chiral crystal structure are optically active, and they have huge phonons. Uh, uh, yeah? Tellurium is ferroelectric. No, tellurium is not for electric. No, no, so, 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 right, so, so the effect is, let me go back, sorry, so not there. Right? So the point is here is that in materials like germanium telluride and tin telluride, you move off the symmetry axis. Right. And so there is a spontaneous displacement, and that spontaneous displacement introduces a macroscopic dipole, which is ferroelectric. <laughs> However, in most of the materials on the next graph, all of these things, these are not, so except for germanium telluride and tin telluride, the rest are not ferroelectric. Nonetheless, you can still observe the dipole moment just by looking at the displacement of an optic phonon, which is now oscillating from side to side. That displacement generates an oscillating dipole. That oscillating dipole is directly measurable uh, by, by an infrared experiment. Okay. And so these have, the point is that they either have, um, uh, um, the, okay. but the point about this material, however, <laughs> is that what this tells you is that this, for example, has a big quadruple in the ground state. Now, what is, what, why does that happen? So, now, as I pointed out, these things are actually past distortions, and therefore, um, uh, the, what, what, you, what you see is that the cubic materials uh, would, uh, in fact, uh, normally, so, so uranium telluride, so if I were to do a cubic structure of arsenic antimony or bismuth, what I would find is that this would be a metal, these bands would cross at this point. If I go to germanium telluride, sorry, it's this tin telluride, I'm sorry. If you go to tin telluride, it turns out because it's ionic, there's already a small gap, but it's very small, actually. Um, those of you who are into the subject of uh, topological insulators will know that a lot of the discussion of topological insulators is associated with a particular ordering of these spin orbit split levels here. This material is not a topological insulator, I'm going to talk about that. But this is the band structure in the cubic step. What happens when you go into the ferroelectric state? Well, the first thing is actually is that this gap, in fact, grows. But the second thing that happens is that the two points on the zone boundary, which this represents, which is called L, this is 1, 1, 1, splits now into 1, 1, 1 and 1, 1, 1 bar. And although this gap gets bigger, one band goes up and the other band goes down. Um, so as a result of that, this is a polar rhombohedral metal attraction because the chemical potential runs across here and there is a band of holes and there is a band of electrons. This is exactly the same thing, actually, as an arsenic antimony and bismuth. This is uh, not new, it's basically it's more or less the same band structure, lots of complicated details which are different. Okay. Um, however, um, uh, because this material is polar, Physically, where these bands belong is in the same place as I was pointing to before. So, back at the unit cell level, whoops, sorry, coming back to this picture, here we are. Back at the unit cell level, these two bands, this is the whole band, this is the electron band, are physically displaced, one lattice constant from each other inside that, because there is a, firstly an inbuilt dipole moment. Um, and then there are carriers which are attracted to that dipole moment, which are those small pockets, and they're doing this. 
So in fact, we already have materials uh, which have exactly that same kind of structure. Um, Um, so now, um, so these things are not just topological insulators. You have offsets between these bands, which you can control by strain by electric fields. And by doing that, of course, you're controlling the density of that electron hole gas, and you should be able to control the density of that electrons. Moreover, you're controlling the form of the interactions because materials like this, as I point out, those excitons have a dipole, and so they have a dipole or repulsive force. Uh, and because these dipoles are big, again, I told you the effective charges are very large, uh, the force between excitons is actually very big. Um, this will tell you, right? Um, actually, if you can make excitons now, these things are actually quadrupolar because you have holes in the middle of electrons on the outside. Um, uh, hasn't been done yet, because there's a long history of looking for. Uh, both conversation of excitons beginning in arsenic, antimony, and bismuth, and in the very dense limit, it doesn't work because, a, because those um, pockets are in fact not cylindrically shaped, but they're cigar shaped, so they don't nest. Um, I'll discuss nesting in a moment when we come down to details. But actually, if you change the carrier density and reduce it, then you should be able to get into the right regime, and it's really possible in these systems because they're polar to be able to influence the bands in a way which is much more tricky uh, than that. Uh, usual problems, masses of light, dielectric constants large, so this is going to be low temperature, this is going to be like gallium arsenate. The big problem, however, um, actually is that when you make these systems as grown, they're typically very heavily p-type. In fact, tin telluride is a superconductor around 2 Kelvin, <coughs> occasionally 8 Kelvin, depending on who you talk to and how it's made. Uh, but, um, you know, again, because of the interest in topological insulators, people are working hard actually to make these materials much closer to the intrinsic limit. So I think there's an opportunity for something will happen here as well. So that's a plug to not work on uh, things with F electrons and to work on things with P electrons. Right. Now. <laughs> So um, now let me talk about. Uh, I left the words. <coughs> so um, I'm now going to go back and talk about some theory. Um, so the um, the theory is <coughs> based on a simple two-band model. Where the bands are full, and we will add carriers. Um, and the first thing we need to do is to construct a wave function of the exciton. Here it is. Um, you put an electron in the conduction band, the momentum K, so I will use C for conduction, V for valence. So I'll create a particle up here, um, we'll create a hole in the lower band. So I'm still using electron creation operators, so this is just destroying electron in the lower band of the same momentum. And having created this pair, I now need to put them into a localized wave packet. And so that means that there is a wave function, phi of k. Um, and of course, for a hydrogenic exciton, um, that exciton wave packet um, will uh, have the form of a Lorentzian. This is just a Fourier transform of the S-state hydrogenic wave function and the length scale is set by the Bohr radius. So, uh, this I hope you've seen before, this is just the wave function of hydrogen um, expressed in this package. Now, how would I now create um, a coherent state of exitons? So, I mean, I wrote this as an operator, phi dagger, it has net momentum zero, it looks a bit like a boson. 
Um, it isn't really a boson because, like a superconducting pair, it actually consists of a pair of fermions. Um, it's a composite boson. Uh, but if I were to think of that as a boson, the natural wave function that you would write down um, for a coherent state of bosons is a coherent state. Um, so what is the coherent state wave function? It's that. Okay. Um, so your guess, your natural guess, to write down uh, is this kind of coherent state. Now what is that written in terms of fermion operators? It's very familiar. Um, it's just a BCS-like wave function of fermions. If you want to see this, you can do this in your head. This is an exponential of that. An exponential of a sum is a product of exponentials. And then you expand out the exponential function. Um, after normalization, this is the first term, this is the second term. And then, of course, you would get squared and cubed and whatever. But because these are fermions, um, you would start uh, with that expansion. The next term which would, which would have an a dagger, a dagger of exactly the same k. And that would all exist. So this expansion just truncates at the second order. Um, um, and, of course, there is a relationship between phi in here and the u's and v's, and the reason, and u squared plus v squared is 1 um, for, for normalization. Um, um, and you have a wave function of this form. So I hope you all understand, by the way, that the BCS state of pairs is a coherent state of pairs. And so the right language to always use about a simple matter, if you want to think about it uh, in, a, in a field theory, is as a coherent state when you're talking about BCS. Um, so, now, the next thing, of course, is what's the U and the V? Now, of course, if this thing was really describing a wave function that looked exactly like bosons, this U and V would be determined simply by uh, lambda, which is going to control the number of particles, and phi, which would have been the bosonic wave function. So you know that in that limit, actually, in the limit where the density is very low, if you look at this parameter v of k as a function of k, um, it's going to have this Lorentzian shape, and it's just going to be lambda times phi. And as I said, lambda tells you how many particles you have. And so this state in this limit where lambda is small, v will reduce to the usual bosonic wave function. Um, and you'll get back something that really looks like a coherent state of bosons. This is a limit where the wave function describes something you call the bosons x of x bars. Now, of course, you see that there will be a problem because these are fermions, because if you now increase lambda, this will grow, and eventually you will hit the number one, which you're not allowed to do. But it's fairly obvious what happens when you hit the number one. Eventually, you have to get all of the way to a Fermi C, um, and in the limit where lambda is large and the density is high, what you will then be describing is something which looks like an instability of two nested Fermi surfaces. Um, and so rather than being a step function, there is a little bit of rounding in here which is associated with the broken symmetry coherent ground step. But um, this wave function, however, interpolates smoothly from the BEC to the BCS limits. There's no transition. There's simply a crossover between a description which looks like this and a description that looks like that. It's one of the very attractive features uh, of this theory. Okay. Uh, the special thing about it here is that there is indeed a broken symmetry. Uh, the broken symmetry actually is, if you like, the coherence and the coherence means that there is a, uh, a conversation, there's an expectation value of this off diagonal operator, which is now just a coherent electron hole state. Whereas ways of visualizing that, I'll give you some more. Um, now, if you really want to do this problem um, at this level, what you, of course, really should be doing is you should be solving your favorite Hamiltonian. And this is the method, and this is precisely equivalent to BCS. Um, and all of this story, by the way, goes back to Keldish in the early 60s uh, when he worked this out. So indeed, you have single particle band energies, Coulomb interaction between them, which in two dimensions, as I'm talking about, is going to be, is going to be one of a cube, 
and the interaction between the electron and the hole will be reduced by the factor depending on the separation D between the layers, between the interacting layers. Here is your variational wave function. You um, take the expectation value of this Hamiltonian with that wave function and you minimize with respect uh, to the parameters. And that gives you two equations. Uh, that gives you an equation for the self energy, for the diagonal self energy, so that's the renormalized single particle energies, which is convenient to measure relative to the chemical potential. We'll understand where that comes in a moment. And this is just the usual exchange uh, term uh, coupling the uh, self energies. And the off diagonal term, the pairing term, which is related to the existence of this broken symmetry, we can turn into uh, an energy parameter, which is plays exactly the same role as the VCS gap in the superconductor. It's k dependent, so there's a delta of k. And that satisfies a self consistent equation, which is the precise analog of the VCS gap equation. Um, obviously, with the possibility of having the solution zero, um, and maybe a finite solution, and you have renormalized quantity <coughs> in the spectrum, um, which has uh, which has these two things added in quadrature, um, the spectrum with the gap. Um, so this is a mechanical procedure. Um, let's do it. Um, so um, and let's think about exactly what this means. Uh, let me just go back over here. Um, I'm looking for the last one. Oh, dear. Oh, yeah, that would be fine. Great, thank you. Um, so, um, so again, the natural parameter to think about is going to be the, the, the parameter Rs. So, when you do these calculations, of course, always um, you don't. You have to introduce a chemical potential. It's the chemical potential that determines the density. Uh, and so we need to plot these things again. So here is Rs, high density here, low density there. Here, if you like, I can plot energies and things like this. And the natural place to start, and this is going to be measured in Rydberg's, that's the uniform energy. This, if you like, is the bottom of the band. This is one Rydberg bound down below the bottom of the band. Therefore, at low densities, the chemical potential must be out here, and so mu will start here, and it will grow like this. And so this is mu, and this is going to be Rs of order 1, somewhere here. And up here, of course, this is just going to be described by free fermions, and therefore this is just going to be 2 over Rs squared. I think it's 2, something like that. This is just h bar squared kf squared over m, because of course kf we go like 1 over r squared s. And so here you have a, some kind of Fermi liquid. Here you have um, excitons. And so you start with the chemical potential now in these units being negative. It's below the bottom of the band. So, this, so when you add these two things together, and if you look at this dispersion, um, you get a dispersion which begins, if you like, at minus mu, which is a positive number, and goes up or a plus mu, which is a negative number, and goes down. And of course, all this represents is that if you've got some band of excitations, this is the ground state of the exciton, and there is simply the excitation band is a gap, which gets you to zero, which is the bottom of the conduction. The bottom of the conduction, they all stand together. And so, and the excitation spectrum is then just trivial, this is just the two renormalized bands, and the fact that you get plus or minus is associated with um, adding an exciton or taking one away. Um, however, um, as you go to higher densities, the chemical potential rises, and at some point it crosses through zero. And as it crosses through zero, these two bands then cross. Um, and when mu is now positive, you get an avoided crossing, and the avoided crossing looks like this. And now 
the gap in the spectrum is produced entirely by correlations. Um, and with the gap being produced by correlations, oh, let's go back again. It's amazing. Uh, um, so the gap being produced entirely by correlations, you get a spectrum with advanced constant. So he was actually a calculation um, uh, to confuse you. Um, the, uh, it, it's done with uh, two different separations. D is the separation between the layers. You get a unit simple radii. It doesn't matter really which one you look at here. Let's take D equals zero. So where we are, the chemical potential begins at minus one, and the chemical potential is this dotted line rising up through here. <coughs> the other solid line here is simply the total energy. That's what you get when you minimize the free energy. And what you discover is that, again, it's basically flat and it comes all the way up. Uh, this one is the spectrum, and if you look at the spectrum at a large RS, uh, what you see is, is that the, sorry, which one is so the spectrum, are, so th this is E of K, um, so you see it's basically, this is, RS is not quite big enough, there's a little bit of dro drooping here, but when you get to a relatively high density, you get an E of K which comes down, and comes up again, and here's the gap, and by the way, the gap itself now is K dependent. But it's just k-dependent in a trivial way. This is an s way. So, so, so d is in units of RS? d is in units of Bohr radius. Of Bohr radius. Okay. Right. And so this one, as you see, this is d is equal to 1. Uh, the energy, unfortunately, is plotted in Hartree's here. In which case, that this energy, so Hartree is two Rydbergs. Uh, so when d equals 1, the energy is greater than eventually end up at minus a half here, if I go off to an extrapolate. But basically, it's more or less the same shape. You see, you're reducing the binding energy, the correlation energy. Um, uh, but it doesn't change very much, the, the form. Um, now, you can also then just look at the occupation V of K, which is remember that this, so this is, you know, what is the density of particle whole pairs? This is RS of 9.6. This is basically the red sin form you expected up here. By the time you've got to RS2, you're producing something which just looks like a rounded Fermi distribution. Um, and <coughs> so this is at the level of the wave function, not, not at the level of thermodynamics. <laughs> just the level of description of the ground state. This basically crosses over from what you want to describe, which is the BCS limit at high density, which is over here, um, and the BC limit at low density, where the chemical potential is, is it becomes much less than zero. And then you can look, for example, at you know, the minimum quasi particle gap, the maximum delta, and all of these things as a function of that. And that's actually not necessarily monotonic. Um, now, I'll say, you know, so now one of the things to, to realize, by the way, is that, that this model was later adopted by uh, Nozier and Schmidt Rink and then adumbrated by various other people to be the standard theory of the BCS to BC crossover in superconductors. They say that the algebra is just the same. Um, it's however much easier to explain in this context. Uh, uh, now, now, one of the things I've pointed out here is that in this theory, this thing is flat. Um, it doesn't have a minimum. We know, for example, that in a multi semi semiconductor like, uh, uh, like, like silicon, there's actually a minimum down here associated with extra correlation energy. That doesn't happen here. You can try making better wave functions for this, and lots of people have done that. And the net effect here is that this doesn't really go very much further along here, and it really stays rather flat. There are clearly, for example, no biexitons in this. Now, if there's a biexiton in here, this actually has to end up with the extra biaxiton binding energy. But I pointed out that the biaxiton binding energy is actually, at equal mass systems, only about 3% of this. And so it's a very small uh, change on, on top of all of this. But those are the kind of things that you begin to get if you put in better wave functions, do uh, quantum Monte Carlo and the like. Um, now, OK, so that's um, one point of view. Now the, the next thing I want to do is actually to take that wave function and make a dictionary for you of all the broken symmetry states um, that you might have seen because there are other ways of looking at this picture. Okay. So as I say, um, 
this wave function, which is just a coherent state of pairs, is BCS. So a different way here. Okay. Um, and traveling from one to the other, there is an algebra that you can use to rewrite this problem, which is to take these pairs, and because they're um, uh, 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 and because you're dealing with spin half fermions, um, you can rewrite them as a spin model. Okay? And the natural spin model to write is to say that ah, I have something which is called an occupation, which is conduction band minus valence band, because that tells me how many particles from a given state have been transferred from there to there. And that's a number, of course, uh, which can go uh, in this language from minus a half to plus half. So I've got spins all the way pointing down and spins all the way pointing up. And of course, the way I get from the balance band to the conduction band is with this operator, which is the raising operator, which I will call S plus. Um, um, and with this mapping, um, this state can be re rewritten like that. So now you get a physical picture of what's going on in here, because of course this thing is, uh, uh, is, is a coherent state of the raising operator. It has a bunch of weights, which are these. The important thing, however, in this language is that all of these weights have exactly the same phase. This is the sense in which they are phase coherent. So the right way to describe this actually is as uh, bunch of processing oscillators, processing spins, however, when they become coherent, they phase lock, and they all process together in a self-consistent field. Yeah, good, okay, thanks. Um, if you um, are familiar with these particular problems, you may recognize this wave function. Okay? So, for example, if you had a quantum ball bilayer, um, at exactly half filled, the u equals a half quantum ball bilayer, you can la label the top layer by up and the bottom layer by down, and this becomes a pseudo spin representation. And this wave function was, I think, first written down by Halperin to describe the, the uh, exotonic pairing of uh, two coupled quantum ball bilayers at u equals a half, same step. Um, if you want to discuss um, exotic magnets bearing a copper silicon oxide, I've forgotten the compound of this, but this is a cuprate, which is an insulator. But however, the ground state is a singlet, the first excited state is a triplet. In a field, the triplet state will cross the singlet. That, get that triplet and singlet crossing those two levels gives you a spin system. That, trans that crossing transition can be described by condensations again of a very similar oscillator. And of course, XY ferromagnets uh, can always be written like this. Um, so, uh, so um, now, um, if I ever get to lecture three, which seems unlikely, okay, um, I will discuss what actually happens if you have a further field in the problem. And in particular, if you have a field which can take these pairs and couple them to light with a photon. Okay. And so now we have a photon field in here, and that model, um, uh, originally I think due to Dickey, that's sometimes called the James Tavis Cummings model, has a ground state now which is a superposition of coherent oscillating photons um, and uh, coherent oscillations of, uh, of, of the two level systems, and this actually is a wave function of a polariton. Um, it's also been proposed as uh, model wave functions actually to think about cold Fermi atomic atoms near a Feshbach resonance where you have a mixture of um, uh, atoms which are paired into molecules and here's a molecular state and here's them uh, living in their in the atomic population. So this model actually, this idea uh, runs through vast amounts of, uh, of <coughs> physics, and it's worth becoming familiar with the various transformations which will get you from one to the other. It has its limitations. And one of the, one of the limitations, actually, is because it's a coherent state, everything here has zero momentum. There are no... Um, uh, um, uh, there, there are no... Um, 
um, acoustic modes in this theory. There's no, there's no, at least not at this level, there's no Goldstone mode associated with the, with the boson. And that, of course, you have to do some more work on top of BCS to include that. But didn't you have a broken symmetry to begin with? Well, the broken symmetry is the phase. It's a U1 broken symmetry. So no, no, but you have a box of that. Well, yeah, no, but I said the theory, doesn't, the theory hasn't put it in yet. I mean, there will be one, and, you know, standard methods will get you. But I'm saying you begin in this language not by talking about BEC at all, you begin in this language by talking about coherent states, then generating the Goldstone mode, then making your low energy theory of that Goldstone mode, which will give you back BEC. Now, in fact, if you do that, it's fairly obvious what I'll see. So here, if you like, is now a calculation of uh, the post transition temperature um, as a function of RS, and now one might allow for some spin degeneracy here. Uh, so G, in some circumstances, can be 2 or 4, depending on what we work with. Uh, uh, and here's the temperature, transition temperature measured in rebirths. It's the usual BCS formula, e to the, minus, the characteristic energy scale, e to the minus 1 over N0V. N0V here scales actually like minus 1 over 2RS. And that produces this line. Now, as I say, if you want to think about the thermodynamics, what's missing in this theory is the soft boson uh, um, mode. So, uh, so in particular, um, what a BCS-like theory does for the transition temperature, it gives you a two-particle spectrum, E versus uh, K, which I say is basically just a gap, which is more than delta. Um, and it is missing the Goldstone mode. This Goldstone mode crosses here at, an, at a scale of order 1 over C, which is the coherence length. If you're in the dilute limit, the gap is large, remember, because the gap is just the breaking of the pair, and the mode is very flat, and therefore the entropy in this at finite temperatures becomes important. In the BC, in the BCS limit, the gap is small and the mode is steep, and you could forget that. This is the last slide. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the last slide I'm going to talk about. Um, and so in that limit, you know what theory you're going to get. You're going to get the theory of, uh, well, actually, it would be costless Thales in this case, but I've just estimated the standard two-dimensional thing. And measuring in sensible units, this actually simply scales like 1 over Rs squared. This is just a transition temperature goes linearly with the density in 2D. And so that's this line, and this is BC. Um, and uh, I think the best way to join up these two theories is not to make a complicated theory in the middle, but just to interpolate, which is why I chose it to do here. Uh, however, many of my colleagues managed to create bumps and wiggles in this great region. Um, so beware if you ever see theories that do that, because there has to be something suspicious. <laughs> um, uh, so now we understand what, what we're talking about. There's a, lip, there's a crossover here. So the transition temperature is low in the high density limit. The transition is low in the low density limit. There's a peak in the middle. Um, this region over here we would call preformed pairs, and where our current experiments on gallium arsenide couple quantum wells, they happen to sit right here, tantalizingly close to the target. Um, uh, but as I say, you know, these are more or less real numbers. Um, so, uh, uh, so, so um, you know, it is believable um, uh, in some sense that one is point uh, close to this limit, um, so consequently, uh, very expensive dilution bridges with optical windows are being bought through various places in order to be able to do this and to go down onto this scale. Because again, for example, if you're trying to do this with gallium arsenide, this is 4 Kelvin, which is here. Uh, the reason is that the gallium arsenide grid is small. It's the wrong system to use. Use something with a bigger binding agent. Um, okay, I'll, I should stop so that you can uh, harass me and then have coffee. Thank you. Thank you. So, I mean, in some sense, I mean, yeah, that's right. So, so if you like, with the, this, this really over here, this, this line simply represents, as you lower the temperature, you form an exit. Right. 
And so in this region, you actually have excitons. At this point, you don't form excitons at all until you get into the superconducting state. But you're right that if I then start about, if I start with this mean field theory, which comes up here, and then I say, well, how do I get this region at all? Where does it come from? It comes actually because of fluctuations in the Goldstone mode, which create finite momentum pairs of excitons moving in and out of the condensate. And those dominate. And those, those, those dominate. But the other way to think about it is, is literally to just up here, it's really best described as just a formation of an exit. Um, yeah. So what happens if you have, like, if, there, if you have a superconductor in the cloud, so then you wouldn't have the dots there in the cloud? Because we have the same well, okay, so the, so the answer, right, so the answer, well, actually the answer is it depends on which channel you want. So of course you don't have it as a dynamical field, you still do effectively have the static fluctuations to begin. So, so yes, yeah, so, uh, so the point is you can't see this mode because the longitudinal version of, the, of this mode of the superconductor turns into the plasma mode, but there still are all of the transverse fluctuations that you have to put in. Yeah, so I mean, good, good point. Is there experimentally a way to test that there are different in, in the region? Yes, absolutely. You know, again, you have to, so basically, in fact, there's not, it's not difficult to convince yourself that you've got this. Because what you can really do is you can do spectroscopy. And so yes, that's been done. And that's been done. Yeah, yeah. So, so you can look at the spectroscopy and you can see that. And actually the challenge is to, is to demonstrate of what would you, well, I mean, in the next lecture, I'll suggest measurements that you can do that would demonstrate that you actually had something to superconduct. Because, of course, it isn't, I mean, the question that comes up, is this a superfluid? Well, a superfluid of what? It's neutral, so there's no currents, there's no electrical currents. There's also no mass currents either, because, of course, if I take the particle whole pair from the left-hand side of the sample and move it to the right-hand side of the sample, it doesn't get lighter over here and heavier over there. So there's no mass transport. So actually, you have to construct measurements if you want to transfer measurements. And that might look like a heat transfer. You, you can get heat transport, but you can't get mass transport. Mm -hmm. So you can look for heat transport, you can look for dipole transport, you can look for things like this. But actually, in the meantime, there's, all, there's some other red herrings that we not red herrings. There's some other things that we need to get through, uh, such so that all of this breaks if you... Uh, um, this Hamiltonian conserves the numbers of particles and holes. Real Hamiltonians don't do that. It makes a difference. Yeah, don't you want to comment or say something about different possibilities? Like singlet, eightlet, eight dimensional and stuff. Well, I mean, it, 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 look, it, indeed. I mean, I think that, that uh, I suppose so. I mean, there's very little. I mean, maybe you've got better reasons like there's very little reason to invest in those calculations until we have well-defined systems that might give rise to that. But is it realistic really to have the possibility for ideal systems? Well, so for example, so we can afford, but well, well, I mean, so, I mean, it, well, by the way, for example, you, you know, as I say, if you could actually uh, change the form of the interaction between the excitons, which you can actually do, uh, you could do that. Uh, you could, of course, start beginning with an exotic band structure and doing this first, um, and then maybe you could do that. But in fact, most of the time, I think that the natural thing to look for is just s I mean, It's very difficult to do. You would need to start with a system where the ground state of your exciton is, you know... No, right. Well, I mean, be careful. I mean, the, the triplet at the... <laughs> You, you mean well? I mean, fine. I mean, the, but remember that that is that those triplet, those those singlet and triplet characteristics are carried by the block functions, and I'm talking here about the envelope functions. But I agree. I mean, I, I, you know, I mean uh, 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 what I would predict is at the moment when somebody discovers anything here, everybody in this room will run off and write a paper about their favorite, you know. Unusual broken symmetry set. So no, I prefer to leave that open until there's some reason to do it. Because all because all of those calculations can be done in ten minutes. So we've had a lot of uh, 
talks about interacting system, and one of the questions which has come up repeatedly is, uh, why do you include or not include screening in your original starting point uh, Hamiltonian, depending on what the object of your calculation is? And I noticed that in, in your mean field theory, you screen the electron hole interaction, but not the electron and hole hole interaction. No, actually, so it's not screen. It's just the distance. It's just the distance. distance. Ah, that's it's just the distance. It's just the distance. Okay. So I did not. So actually, these doing... calculations are done with bare interactions. Okay, that went by the uh, fast. Good. You know, so in, 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 I don't know. I mean, in a few slides, I will discuss. Actually, maybe I, I can put something in to discuss that. If you look at FFLO-like states, where in particular you have a situation where you have fermionic carriers left over after you paired the rest, then it turns out that screening will quantitatively change the answer, but doesn't seem to qualitatively change it. So, um, and, uh, Yeah, and along, along the discussion, I thought that you have took the some assumptions. One is the particle hole symmetry yep. that you have said, and then there's another one is electron holes have the same mass because comes with the same band message. So everything goes at epsilon k minus, mu squares and so on. Now, okay, so, 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 so two things. So, so, the, yeah. so first, so the, the most important thing which matters down here in this region is just the particle hole symmetry. Right, so if so, we go yeah. away from that assumption, right. you can still work on the, you know, at least BCS, we can easily work on it, very straightforward. Yeah. Can you still get a mass current and charge current if you break the assumptions? Uh, the answer is I think no. But let me ask, let me ask this, let me try and answer the simpler questions that you didn't ask because you know the answer, right? So the first thing is that, um, suppose you, in this region here, which is BCS, the answer depends on the two Fermi surfaces being exactly nested in order to get a transition temperature at all. Um, and of course, you know, in a typical semiconductor, the, the, um, uh, the, the Fermi surfaces are nested. So even if there's equal densities, the electron will typically look like that, and the hole will sort of look square. What that does is that that just kills the transition very rapidly down here, rather than exponentially just stops at the region where there's no transition, because we don't have perfect nesting. Of course, superconductors in zero field always have perfect nesting. Right? So that's, that's the first thing. Um, so uh, it doesn't make much difference out here. Um, so the next question is, um, Good one. Can you get a charge current and can you get a mass current? You still don't get a charge current. I think for reasons which are more or less obvious. That's right. C dagger C. C dagger C. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. Do you get a mass current? Right. Um, and there, actually, there's been a debate okay, about whether you well, about whether you can actually uh, get a mass current. My view is also no. And, and I think the reason for that again is go back to the thought experiment. Um, you know, the, 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 I mean, the, these are um, a hole is an absence of an electron. So, you know, here's the left hand side of the circle. I make an electron hole pair here. I don't change the mass when I create the electron hole pair at all, even if the particles, the band masses are different. The actual mass is completely unchanged. Right? Um, and so, so this, so in fact, even if the electron and hole masses are different in the sense of actually generating a, a proper mass current. Um, there is no mass of an exciton. It actually has zero mass. It doesn't change anything at all. Okay. So in a sense, the central mass is fixed. The central mass. It's, that, well, it's, it's, to do, it's, it's exactly to do with the central mass rather than the, rather than the relative mass. But I think it's easy to see this one. Uh, it's also easy to get the wrong answer if you think about it in a, in, in, in a, in a, in, in a way which is, is, is slightly too complicated. <laughs> you just think about this, it's sort of obvious you have to get there. But it's very easy to do the algebra wrong and get a different answer. Um, if you include photons that you are so, that have mass. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll think about that in time. I mean, no, I mean indeed. So the, but it's see, that as, as, as Daniel mentioned, you can have a heat current because there's entropy here. Um, and furthermore, you, have, you can have a current of dipole. Yeah. Right. Um, and I'll you know, discuss possible ways of looking at this. But this thing couples the light, right? 
Well, as well, okay. So, so the you, you, you're indeed getting ahead a little bit. So, if I were to do something sensible, right, like uh, like to realize that the decay of this uh, of this will generate a photon, you realize actually that it's automatic. Then, at the moment that you create in this system a coherent state of excitons, you've got this big oscillating dipole which generates a macroscopic electric field, which will generate a classical light pulse. So it isn't just actually that individual photons decay into light. If you happen to get into this state and then turn on the coupling to light, it will radiate very rapidly and it will ring down. So, it, it, so it's super luminous. Super dark, super luminous. Super radiant. I think this is now a very good subject to continue at the coffee break. Fine. And, and maybe in the We'll last. meet again uh, at what time? 11.10, right? Mm -hmm. At 11.10 with the next lecture by uh, I Me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. Yeah, it's a little young. Is that okay? Oh, yeah. yeah, okay. I was not guessing, but nobody told me exactly.